Uh, well, <clears throat> that reading was from the Gospel of John, as were uh, the Gospels of um, the two last Sundays that we have heard, the healing of the man born blind and the conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. And uh, we hear a lot of the Gospel of John at this time. In fact, from Monday, uh, last Monday, uh, we began in, uh, at the daily, in daily math uh, reading from the Gospel of John. And this will continue until Pentecost, um, a long way ahead. So, in fact, uh, there will be, well, from last Monday until Easter, it's about three weeks, and then there are the seven weeks of Eastertide. So there will be ten weeks of listening to the Gospel of John. Now, there are some exceptions. Obviously, we don't. Uh, the other Gospels are not uh, deleted, as it were, for that time. Next Sunday, Palm Sunday, we will hear the Passion according to Mark. But on Good Friday, as on every Good Friday, every year, we hear the Passion according to John. And we will hear, as I say, all through Eastertide, that same Gospel again and again. John, John, John. Now, what does that Gospel say? It's the fourth Gospel. Uh, it is often regarded as the most wonderful of all the four. It is um, a great piece of world literature, not going beyond anything else. But um, what does that gospel say about itself? It says at, at the very end of chapter 21, the last chapter, that this gospel uh, contains the testimony, uh, verbal testimony and written testimony of the disciple whom Jesus loved. We call him often the beloved disciple. And he is actually never named in the Gospel of John. And he remains a somewhat mysterious figure. But uh, he appears at key points in the Gospel of John. It is he who during uh, the discourse at the Last Supper, during the Last Supper, is the one who is closest to Jesus with his head uh, resting on Jesus' breast. He is the one, says the disciple whom Jesus loved, says the Gospel, who was standing with Mary and the other two Marys at the foot of the cross. It is he, the disciple whom Jesus loved, says the Gospel, doesn't give him a name, who on Easter Sunday morning, this is the Gospel we'll, we'll hear on Easter day, ran with Peter to the empty tomb that Mary Magdalene had reported. And uh, the Gospel says twice that he was the first to reach the tomb. He was the first to reach the tomb. There must be a significance there. He didn't go in first. He stood back and let Peter go in first. Peter is Peter, okay. So let Peter go in. But then he looked in and it says he saw and he believed. So he was the first to believe in the resurrection. And then in the final chapter, the scene by the lake when they catch the fish and the mysterious stranger on the shore, and it's the disciple whom Jesus loves who says, it is the Lord. That's that man on the shore cooking fish. Okay. So it's the gospel that we hear is his testimony to Jesus. And you see why we, the church reads it at this time of the year. Because this mysterious man was obviously deeply involved in all these events, in the Last Supper, in the Passion, in the Resurrection. He was at the heart of the action, we might say. 
and had a unique insight. And it's that insight that is passed on to us every year at this time of the year to help us share the same insight and to see what is going on. So it's the Paschal Gospel, we might say. It's the Easter Gospel. And uh, a very wonderful thing it is. Now we can think a little more about this gospel, the fourth gospel. It's the gospel uh, that tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's the gospel that tells us the Word was made flesh, this famous statement, and we saw his glory, the glory as of an only begotten Son. It's the gospel which tells us of the turning of the water into wine at the wedding of Cana. It's the gospel, as we know from our Lenten liturgy, that tells us of the conversation, the remarkable conversation with the Samaritan woman by the well. It tells us, as we had last Sunday, of the healing of the man born blind. It tells us of today the raising of Lazarus, Jesus' most stupendous miracle. It's the gospel that includes the famous discourse in chapter 6 on the bread of life. I am the bread of life. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. This is from John. We wouldn't know this if it wasn't for this beloved disciple. It's the gospel in which Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. It's the gospel in which Jesus says seven times, uh, I am something or other. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's the gospel, chapter 13, that tells us of how at at his final supper, Jesus took on the role of a slave and washed the feet of his disciples and then gave this, this great farewell discourse, maybe too solemn a word, they had this final conversation with his disciples in which he gave them the new commandment to love one another as I have loved you. It's the gospel that has the longest prayer of Jesus, the whole of chapter 17. The priestly prayer, as it's called, Father, the hour has come. It's the gospel which contains in, in, in its passion narrative the account of the piercing of Jesus' side by the spear of the soldier and the blood and water coming forth. It's the gospel that contains the beautiful meeting between Jesus and Mary Magdalene on Easter morning in the garden. It's the gospel which has Thomas, who had a genius for missing the bus, as it were, but how eight days afterwards uh, Jesus appears to him and the other disciples and reads Thomas's thoughts, reads his doubts, and convinces him. And it ends, chapter 20, with that magnificent profession of faith, my Lord and my God. And then in the very final chapter, 21, it's the gospel with the great catch of fish. And then that wonderful conversation between Jesus and Peter, Simon, do you love me? Three times. So take the gospel, take this gospel away. My gosh, what a lot we would lose. How much poorer would be our understanding of Jesus. It's the gospel that is in many ways very sacramental. It speaks of unless you are reborn of water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God, the sacrament of baptism. It talks, as I said, of the bread of life, of my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus calls himself the vine. You are the branches. This is our sacramental mystical union with Christ, so it's full of beautiful things. The first half, the, Jesus works seven signs, beginning with that at Cana and ending with the gospel we've just heard, the most astonishing sign of all, when he raises a man four days dead from death. It's a gospel of double meanings, always. You go deeper and deeper 
into this. There's always two meanings, two meanings in the Gospel of John. That's why it's, it's really a Gospel uh, that anybody can, can access because it's, 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 it's very simple. Uh, he doesn't have a huge complicated vocabulary actually in this Gospel. And yet, um, as they say, uh, you know, a poodle, a poodle wouldn't drown and an elephant can swim uh, in, this, in this gospel. It's, it's a beautiful thing. And it's a gospel that we, we see this very clearly in uh, and Martha shines out today, which invites us to faith. Jesus is, is the one, the word, the only begotten son who has come into this world, who, who does these things, says these things, and invites us to believe in him, and by believing in him, to have life, fullness of life, eternal life. That's the simple choice that listening to this gospel leaves us. Do we believe or do we not? Do we choose the light or do we remain in the dark? There it is. And it, as I say, it, it, it's the gospel that helps us see the glory of Christ. Sees this, it, it's, it's somehow a translucent gospel. It's like, you know, stained glass with light shining through it. There's always this deeper, deeper meaning, this depth to it, which shines through very simple human episodes, the light that comes from God and is to be a light for our lives. Last thought is that we can say that this actually is the Marian gospel. It's got, in some way you can call this the gospel of Mary. Why? Why? We will hear this on Good Friday. There is that scene at the foot of the cross where the mother of Jesus is there, and beside her is this beloved disciple. And Jesus says um, to her, woman, behold your son. He is dying. He is leaving her. She is surely a widow by this time. To be a widow at, uh, in that period of history, was, in that place, was not a pleasant experience. You were very bereft. You were in a very economically insecure situation. And so, uh, again, at the simple level, Jesus is caring for his mother by in, entrusting her to the care of this man. And he says to the beloved disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, says the gospel, he took her to his own home. He took her to his own home. That's the translation we hear. But actually, again, there is a double meaning there. And the Greek says, uh, has a, an unusual phrase, which means he took her into what was his own, into, into, the most in, into his most intimate self. You could translate it like that. He really took the mother of Jesus into his heart, into his life. Now think, think. They did that. What, on a winter's evening in Jerusalem, over their fish supper, if you like. Would the mother of Jesus and this disciple have talked about? What sort of questions would he have had for her who had known this extraordinary man all through his life? Surely they would have, they would have exchanged their reminiscences. They would have tried to understand who he was. And this is a remarkable thing because who is Jesus above all in the Gospel of John. He is the one, it, we heard it again today, who has come from the Father, who has been sent by the Father, who is the only Son of the Father, and who comes to invite us to share his relationship with the Father. Now, who of any early Christian knew that more 
than Mary, the Virgin Mother of God. Who knew more than anyone that this person had been sent, had come, come to her first of all, come to her womb, come to her heart, come to her life, and then on, come to the whole world. She knew that in a unique way, and she passed that insight on to John, and it's the core of his gospel. So when we hear this gospel, we are, we are hearing Mary as well as the beloved disciple. Okay, two weeks only till Easter. We are going up to Jerusalem. We're going up to Jerusalem. We want to go together. We go as a community of faith, and we want to go surely with Mary and with the beloved disciple behind me on the, east, the eastern end. There is Christ on the cross, and there is Mary on one side. There is the beloved disciple on the other. This may be a good time of year, if you read scripture uh, at home, to focus on the Gospel of John. Uh, if you don't, at least prick up your ears uh, at the moment that the Gospel is announced. Whose Gospel is it? If it says it's the gospel according to John, ah, it's the gospel of the beloved disciple. It's the gospel of Mary. It will help me see his glory this Easter, this Pentecost, this year. In my, you know, poor little life, I will see the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father.